Upon a time, there was a man called Jonah. A bit of an individual, a bit of a loner. A good sort of fellow. With a heart of gold. But rather slow at doing what he was told. He was sent to Nineveh to preach the word of God. The people there weren't Hebrews, so he thought it rather odd. But he put on his coat and he put on his topper. Picked up his passports and went off to Joppa. Oh. Joppa? <clears throat> Joppa. He told God a whopper. Yes. And from there, he set sail for Tarshish. Can't make that rhyme. So Jonah went aboard and the ship set sail. And very shortly after, it began to blow a gale. The dark clouds gathered and the waves rose high. The lightning flashed and thunder crashed along the purple sky. The steep seas piled like a green rock face. And Jonah took his teeth out just in case. <laughs> Whoa. The boat was tossed and battered, doing forward rolls and flips. And there weren't too many takers for the sausage, egg and chips. <laughs> anyway, cutting a long story short. The boat was out at sea and they were miles away from port. They threw the cargo overboard and lighted the ship. And found Jonah below deck trying to have a kip. They prayed to all the gods they knew. And cast lots to find the sinner. And rather unsurprisingly, Jonah was the winner. Hooray! Good for him! Uh, no, not really. Why not? The prize was the opportunity to swim home. <laughs> they threw him overboard? Yup. That's not much of a prize, is it? Water, water everywhere. Not any drop to drink. He was cold and he was lonely and his socks began to shrink. <laughs> the night drew in. The boat was gone. He thought it was the end. But God knew what was going on and sent along a friend. Actually, it was a great big fish that swallowed Jonah whole. And from inside the fish, Jonah prayed that God would save his soul. He promised he would do what's right, hoping God would understand. And after three days inside the fish, he was hurled onto dry land. <laughs> Here. <coughs> then Jonah went to Nineveh and did a lot of good. He preached and people started doing what they ought to should. Sick man, bid, shock, all the newspapers said. Jonah preaches word of God, nobody feared dead. So Jonah learned the hard way, what he always should have guessed. The one thing worth remembering? God, God always, always knows, knows what's best. best. who from time to time have been the enemies of God's people. Nineveh is located in modern-day Iraq. Jonah is sent there to preach against its wickedness and call them to repentance, but he does not want this mission. He doesn't want them to repent. He doesn't want God to show them mercy. He really didn't like people that weren't his people. He really fancied the idea of God smiting the Assyrians. He wasn't a fan of them repenting. He didn't object to the idea of being God's messenger. He didn't mind preaching. He just wanted to choose his own pulpit. He wanted to choose who would receive God's mercy. We should always be careful that we don't yield to the same temptation. We also do not get to choose who receives God's mercy. There are people you don't like who, if they repented, God would be merciful to them. They would be forgiven. They would have a place in heaven. Can you relate to Jonah's situation? Has God ever asked you to do something you simply do not want to do? It doesn't have to be like Jonah, according to missionary service in Iraq. I don't fancy that right now. It may be that God is asking you to, I don't know, give more money to the work of the kingdom, or apologize.
apologize to someone who has wronged you have wronged, or forgive someone who has wronged you, or do something, or stop doing something, take a job, retire, whatever God's calling you to do, I don't know, but I know what it's like when God calls you to do something you don't want to do. That's how Jonah felt. So he decided to run away from God, partly I think um, because his poor understanding of God meant he was he thought God was the God of the Hebrews, um, and therefore if he went out of God's territory, God wasn't going to be there anymore. Okay, he was wrong. So he heads off to Tarshish via the port of Joppa. Now Tarshish is probably in modern day Spain. Um, so really, he, off he goes, he decides to run away from God. Um, he doesn't seem to realise that there is nowhere where God is not, <coughs> as in God is everywhere. We sometimes try to run away from God too. We may not do it geographically. You know it's possible to run away from God inside your own head. To avoid listening to him. And trying not to do what he's calling us to do. I can't hear you, we say, while deliberately not listening. We can run away from God without going anywhere. You can run away from God and still be here every Sunday morning. You'll look the same on the outside, and the rest of us, we're not that smart, won't know what's going on inside you. We won't know that you're running away from God. You won't know that you're being disobedient. Eventually, their signs will show, however. Eventually, you'll either stop coming here, or you'll stop worshipping God, because to live in disobedience to God is a very, very uncomfortable place to be. Well, it is if you also then try to go to God's house and worship him. These two things do not go well together. But Jonah decided to run away geographically. He headed to Tarshish, as I say, a, a port town in southern Spain called Tarsusus, probably. Now, I'm pretty bad at geography, but even I know that if you're in Israel and God sends you to Iraq, you've gone, to the wrong, you've gone in the wrong direction if you're heading for Spain. But God does not let him go. And that is God's mercy to Jonah and to us. He loves us too much to leave us the way that we are. He loves us too much to leave us in our disobedience. So God sent a storm. None of us like to be caught up in a storm. It's not very nice. I, I was out on my mobility scooter the other day when it decided to rain like torrentially. I, I arrived dripping wet. Mud up my legs. I did not enjoy this storm, and I was only out in it for five minutes. So, we don't like storms, literal storms. But we don't really like other storms, too. You see, I think a storm is a good metaphor for when things are going a bit, a bit wrong in life, a bit, a bit hairy. This happens to us from time to time. It's ordinary that we experience a storm. Bad things happen to everybody. Being a Christian does not exempt us from them. It's part of the human Christian condition. You see, being a person means that sometimes your friends or family will let you down. You might get made redundant. You might have a terrible time at work. People might get sick. People will die. These are the storms that everybody goes through. These are just storms of life. But it seems to me that there are also some special storms that God sends our way. Circumstances designed to get our attention when we're going in the wrong direction. That's why when everything is going wrong for you, when everything's going wrong in your life, it's sometimes good to ask the question, is there something else that I'm missing? Am I doing something wrong? Am I going the wrong way? The sailors knew the difference between a storm and a supernatural storm. See, they knew this was no ordinary storm. They knew it was a storm of God. They knew it was designed to get their attention. And so they turned to prayer. Now, they prayed to every deity they knew to cover a wide variety of bases. Um, and in the end, they, they found the right, found the right uh, person who would cause the storm. But I want to ask you, are you in a storm right now? 
Does your life feel like a whirlwind? Is it maybe worth asking, are these just life circumstances or is God trying to get my attention? Storm, an overwhelming experience, can be God's way of getting us to turn around when we're going the wrong way. It is an act of mercy, but it does not feel like it when you're going through it. It's interesting to note that the storm sent by God for the purposes of turning Jonah around affected more than Jonah. It affected those who were with him and it put them in danger. Sometimes the effects of our disobedience affect those around us. Those in our lives, those we care for, those who journey in faith with us. So where was Jonah in this storm caused by his disobedience? He was asleep. Running away from God is tiring. Or maybe he's trying to run away from God by going to sleep. That is another technique for avoiding God. My dad used to do something similar at family gatherings. Now, my dad was not overly fond of my mother's family, and I'm not going to lie, they were a bit demanding. So, if they were sat in the living room, and they'd, they'd had a glass of sherry, and their glass was empty, and they wanted another, and my dad walked past, they would just do this and hold up the glass, expecting him to go refill it and bring it back, like he was a servant in his own house. He used to take the glass and then go and sit in the kitchen for an hour. Um, however, when he was sitting in the living room with the family, he would um, sit in his chair and fall asleep. Well, at first he would be pretending. He was very good at pretending to be asleep. Um, and then sometimes he would actually fall asleep and snore. Um, but, you know, you'd be like, oh, Dad's asleep, and he'd go, oh, no. He was trying to escape from a situation he didn't like being in, namely family gatherings. And Jonah's doing the same. He's trying to escape from God. I don't want to be here, so... Running away from God by going to sleep. So the captain wakes him up and tells him he needs to pray. And he says he doesn't pray. It's hard to pray when you're running away from God. Prayer is a conversation within a relationship. You can't talk to somebody while you're running away from them. So cutting a long story short, Jonah eventually confesses that the storm is his fault. He doesn't repent. He doesn't say, I'll turn the ship round, head back to Joppa, and I'll go to, do, go to Tarshish and do what's right. He just says, all right, that's fine. It's my fault. Throw me overboard. He doesn't make excuses, and he doesn't lie. We can learn from that example. So often when we're caught doing something wrong, we start to justify ourselves. Um, uh, you don't understand my circumstances. I'm just a product of my upbringing. I'm only human. Everybody makes mistakes. It's just a foible, a quirk of mine, an idiosyncrasy, a character trait. As my daughter would say, you just don't understand. <laughs> I've been 14, I do understand, and you're still not having it. <laughs> we don't call things what they are. We call it an escape, and, and it, um, a mistake, or an ex we make excuses. We, we kind of don't call things what they are. Sin is sin. Disobedience. If we make excuses for our behaviour, we forget this one thing. We have a solution for sin. We have a solution for sin. Our disobedience and our wrongdoing. Jesus didn't die for foibles, quirks, idiosyncrasies or character traits. He didn't die for mistakes or things we can justify due to our upbringing or current circumstances. He died for sin. That we have a solution for. I don't know if we have a solution for all of those other things. So sometimes we need to go, no, I was wrong. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Better than making excuses. Jonah did have a solution, though. He did. His solution was they should throw him overboard and let him drown. I prefer the solution that we have since Jesus came, which is that God forgives us when we repent. Anyway, the sailors did not want to throw a man overboard. 
And here's the irony. The Gentile saviors tried to save the life of an Israelite prophet who did not want to tell the Gentiles about the saving power of God. But in the end, they had no choice and they threw him overboard. And the sea became calm. The sailors then, having seen the power of God, turned to him, made vows to him. And the very thing that Jonah is trying to avoid, which is God showing mercy to people who aren't Israelites, happens. God uses Jonah even when he's being disobedient. How annoying must that be? So God uses us, us often not because of us, but despite us. Because if you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit within you. And sometimes God works through you even when you're trying to be going in the opposite direction. My favourite expression is, God draws straight lines with crooked sticks. <laughs> Jonah was disobedient. He was in error. He knows he's in the wrong. He's still not repentant. He'd rather die than preach the gospel to people who aren't like him. And yet, God uses his testimony about God to bring these sailors into a relationship with him. And meanwhile, Jonah, he's swimming home. But the Lord does not let him drown. He provides a means of rescue. Not the means of rescue Jonah would necessarily have chosen. He probably would have chosen a boat. But he needed a fish. Because although he had admitted his wrongdoing, he had not repented. He needed time inside the fish to bring him to repentance. Reminds me of that joke. The, there's a guy, um, he's on, he's on, there's a flood. And the guy's climbed up onto his roof and he's sat on the roof of his house. And he's a Christian, so God's going to save me. So a guy, uh, one of his neighbours comes past with a boat and says, get in the boat. And he says, no, it's all right. He said, God's going to save me. In the end, fire and rescue come by with a boat. And they say, you've got to get in the boat. The water's rising. And he says, no, it's okay. God's going to save me. In the end, the helicopter comes and they throw down a ladder and they say, climb aboard. The water's rising. The water rises, the man dies, and God said, he says to God when he gets to heaven, he says, I had faith in you, I believed you, why didn't you save me? And God says, I sent you two boats and a helicopter, what more do you want? We don't get to choose our means of rescue, we don't get to choose who helps us, and who helps us get in a right relationship with God. Sometimes we have to be humbled by God as he sends people we don't like, who are younger than us, less experienced than us, or even not even Christians to set us on a right path. We don't get to choose our means of rescue. And Jonah did not choose a fish. Eventually, the fish vomits Jonah onto dry land, lovely, and God calls him a second time to go to Nineveh. It's a new old calling. When Jonah came back to God, his calling was the same. Now, that's not always the same for us. Sometimes we've missed an opportunity or God has sent somebody else in our place. The one thing we can guarantee is that there is always a calling on our lives. Not necessarily a, what we call a big calling to move to a foreign country and preach to them about Jesus or, or become, a, become a vicar or something. Sometimes the calling that God has on our lives is different but no less significant. God may be calling you to be a good neighbour in your neighbourhood and to talk to your neighbours about a relationship with God. He may be calling you to have a, um, a ministry of compassion, helping people through bereavement. I don't know what he's calling you to, but God always has a calling for you. Jonah's calling was the same. He was called to preach to the people of Nineveh. He was given a second chance to obey the instruction that God had given him. I want to know, how many people are here today because God has given us a second chance? How many of us has, have not been guilty of desertion or defiance in response to God's commands? Anyone here being fully obedient to God for the whole of their walk with him? Probably not. Can I invite you to smell your clothes? Smell your clothes, one. I love this. People actually do this myself. Smell your clothes. Fine. What can you smell? Fabric conditioner? Perfume, a sly cigarette that you had before church. Fish vomit. 
Because I can guarantee that every one of us who are here, who are in a relationship with God, has, at some point, refused to do what God has called them to do and gone in the opposite direction. You have found yourself in peril, in a storm, in a fish, vomited up and then restored. And that means that we, the church of the fish vomit, have absolutely no right to judge others. Our responsibility is to help to restore those who have been disobedient to God's call. We are a community of fallen people saved by grace. We are a community of disobedient people who have been restored. We are a community who are familiar with the smell of fish vomit. So where are you this morning? Have you been called by God to do something difficult? A particular task or way of life? Maybe God's calling you into a relationship with him for the first time. I don't know. Do you find yourself considering running in the opposite direction? Are you considering purchasing a ticket to Tarshish? Well, let me tell you, it's not worth it. And I speak from experience. It's not worth it. You can run from God, but you can't hide. There is nowhere where God is not. And God loves you way, way too much to let you get away. Perhaps this morning you already know you're running to God, running away from God. Maybe you're in a storm of your own making, in a fish, feeling miserable. Or maybe you, maybe you're being, um, maybe you know you're being disobedient and it's time to repent and be restored. The good news is that God is the God of second chances. And you might be sitting there thinking, well, I've had my second chance, love. I've had my third chance, my fourth chance, and to be honest, I've, I've, you know, I've had them all, really. There's a, a bit, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie, you know, I've had my, this is, I think I'm on my last chance. I think there's a fat chance that God's got anything for me to do, and there's a slim chance I'm gonna respond to this message, because there's no chance that I can be used by God now. God is the God of the second chance, and the third chance, and the fourth chance, the last chance, the fat chance, the slim chance, and the no chance. So where, where you consider yourself to be this morning, if you repent, God will take you back. He will restore you. He will have a calling for you, because he wants to use each and every one of us to build his kingdom. The book of Jonah ends with a question. The last thing in the book of Jonah is a question mark. The question at the end of the book is, God says to Jonah, should I not be concerned about that great city? And it ends with a question of whether Jonah will change his attitude and repent himself. And this sermon ends with a question too. God has offered you, God is offering you, God continually offers you and me another chance. Will you take it to me?